everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Genesis Week, the weekly creationary commentary on news, views, and events related to the Origins controversy. The first ever episode exclusive to YouTube. I'm your host, Ian Juby. Remember, if you get lost in cyberspace, just hit up wazulu.com, that's W-A-Z-O-O-L-O-O.com, or go to genesisweek.com, you will find us. The July issue of Molecular Biology and Evolution has a report stating that non-Africans, i.e., Whites like me have Neanderthal ancestry. Meh, I've been called worse. Now, I've been saying for years that Neanderthals are completely human. In fact, I specifically addressed this in my response to Scientific American's special edition to Darwin and Evolution, January 2009. My multi-part response, which I never did finish, is posted on my website, and there has been lots of articles, in particular over the past couple of years, affirming over and over that Neanderthals are completely human. This latest study analyzes the X chromosome in modern humans and confirms what was already said in the past. Neanderthals and humans interbred. Well, by definition, if they interbreed and have fertile offspring, they are the same species. So this is no surprise to the creation community, but it's good to see the research being done. Science Daily reports on a fossil fig wasp, dated by evolutionary assumptions, is around the 35, 34 million year old mark. Yeah, give or take a week. The fig wasp is a fascinating insect in that the wasp is dependent upon the fig tree for its existence, and the fig tree is dependent upon the fig wasp for its existence. Dr. Steve Compton of the University of Leeds said of this fantastic fossil find, this means that the complex relationship that exists today between the fig wasps and their host trees developed more than 34 million years ago and has remained unchanged since then. So 34 million years of evolution has caused the fig tree and the fig wasp to evolve into the fig tree and the fig wasp. That's not evolution, that's stasis. Things reproducing faithfully after their own kind, and it is powerful evidence for creation. The fig tree and the fig wasp actually make a codependent relationship. One can't exist without the other, so which came first? The fig tree, which needs the fig wasp to live, or the fig wasp, which needs the fig tree to live? Or were they both designed and created together at the same time? This is powerful evidence of design, a designer, and creation. Tick, 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 Dalek has been in the news again lately. Spurned on by a recent report in PNAS in which researchers took DNA from a fish and transplanted it into a mouse. The transplanted DNA strand was a genetic switch which turns on the genes controlling fin growth in the fish. When transplanted into the mouse, the same genetic switch turned on the growth of the digits on the mouse embryo's limbs. Now, because we know that fish evolved 400 million years before mice with the arrival of the fishopods like Tiktaalik, this is clearly evidence of common ancestry between these organisms. Wait a minute. <laughs> Let me get this straight. My Dodge Caravan has power windows. So does my Ford Aerostar. Both of these windows are controlled by a switch. So I can take that switch out of my Dodge Caravan, transplant it into my Aerostar, and have it control the window, and it has absolutely nothing to do with common descent. This was a genetic switch that was transplanted into the mouse embryo, which is just as easily evidence of a common designer. Using vehicles as an analogy, once an engineer goes through all the effort of designing, prototyping, and building, say, a transmission, they're going to use that same transmission in multiple types of vehicles. This is good engineering. It's smart engineering. It saves work. Likewise, a designer of both the fish and mouse would use similar identical genes and mechanisms in both. That's smart engineering, and it has nothing to do with common descent. But this study was inspired by the famous Canadian fishopod Tiktaalik, found in the Canadian high Arctic in 2004. Evolutionists believe that fish grew legs and walked up on land and have a sequence of these intermediate fishopods, halfway between fish and the land-walking tetrapods. There was a gap in their evolutionary sequence, however, right around the 375 million year mark. So the evolutionists went looking for a creature that was half fish, half tetrapod, in allegedly 375 million year old rock, and found Tiktaalik. A big deal was made about its limbs, although most of its limbs were missing, and Tiktaalik was heralded as not only proof of evolution, pr but proof that evolution finally made a successful prediction. 
Well, apparently nobody informed the genetic researchers that Tiktaalik was hurled out of the evolutionary tree in January of 2010 with the discovery of fossil tetrapod footprints in Poland, dated by the evolutionists as 395 million years old. Don't know if you noticed or not, but obviously feet were around before Tiktaalik, which was supposedly trying to evolve feet. In fact, the Polish footprints blew the entire fishapod sequence out of the water. Dawkins' book, The Greatest Shoe on Earth, had just come out, touting Tiktaalik as the ultimate in evidence for evolution. Oh well, so much for that chapter. But that's okay. The Royal Terrell Museum in Drumheller, Alberta had a unique solution to the problem. In spite of everybody else dating Tiktaalik at 375 million years old, the Terrell dated it at 400 million years old. Problem solved. Eh. It's not like that age is specific or anything anyway. Woohoo! Mail for me? This past week I released two new rants on dating methods. To the rants and raves of critics who apparently didn't bother to watch the video nor read the references I so conveniently provided. In Karibo rant number 100 I discussed radio dating methods of the rocks. And one of the examples I provided was the potassium argon dating of the Mount St. Helens lavas which gave ages of millions of years to rocks that were only 10 years old. Apparently many viewers missed the point. One viewer commented that we were using the wrong tool for the job. <laughs> Wait a minute. The potassium argon method was specifically designed to date lava rocks. What dating method did you expect us to use? His response, you used the wrong tool, you should have used a newspaper to date the rocks. Apparently people didn't realize they made my point. If rocks are young, say 6,000 years old, then apparently you are agreeing that radio dating methods are going to give an incorrect, drastically inflated age of the rocks, thus successfully shooting yourself in the foot and discrediting all rock dating methods provided to date. Glad to see you agree with me. In Crevo rant number 101, I discussed the carbon-14 dating method. Now, my videos get trolled in the comments by several consistent YouTubers like Jeebus, Six Christ, and the Science Foundation, both of which demonstrated that they did not understand the arguments of the skeptics let alone the creationary response. Jeebus Six Christ wrote, Ha ha ha, 99% uranium. I guess you do not know how radiation works. The coal does not have to be uranium in order for it to be irradiated by uranium. Moreover, this is why people laugh at creationists. Ha ha ha. Well, thanks for writing in, Jeebus, but apparently you missed the point. I wasn't saying the coal had to be uranium. I said that in order to form the very high quantities of carbon-14 in the coal with radiation, it would require 99% uranium to get the sufficient amount of radiation. He went on, Erroneous dates such as the examples you were talking about do not become contaminated by the air. Only a creationist would make an argument that laughable. Oh, Jeebus, you have much to learn, my young Padawan. If you had actually paid attention in the video, you would have realized that it was not a creationist who made that argument. It was, in fact, an evolutionist who made that claim. I was merely responding to said laughable claim. Baumgartner responded to said laughable ar arguments back in 2007, and the detailed response is available on the Jancers and Genesis website. He went on, The contamination comes from nitrogen-14 being trapped in the Earth next to radioactive elements. Not sure if you were trying to lie to the public or if you were just ignorant of how this works. Uh, wait a minute, am I really the one who is ignorant here? Evidently, Jeebus did not realize he said exactly what I said in Crevo rant number 101. He's claiming contamination by underground radioactive sources. But the coal contains such large amounts of carbon-14, and underground radioactive elements produce such infinitely small amounts of carbon-14, that in order to produce the amount of carbon-14 in the coal, the coal would require huge amounts of, say, uranium on the order of 99% of the sample by volume. In fact, even though I provided references, neither Jeebus nor the Science Foundation bothered to even look them up, as this argument was addressed in detail in the Rate 2 book. No problem, let me help you out here, guys. Here's the book. Let's look at page 605, where we read, The 10 coal samples were obtained from the U.S. Department of Energy Coal Sample Bank maintained at Pennsylvania State University. We selected 10 of the 33 coals available with an effort to obtain good representation geographically, as well as with respect to depth in the geologic record. Our 10 samples include 3 Eocene, 3 Cretaceous, and 4 Pennsylvanian coals. But 
According to Pseudoscience Foundation, no, C-14 is not found in every coal deposit, only those adjacent to uranium pockets and coal deposits adjacent to uranium deposits contain carbon-14, but it's not anomalous. Hogwash. You obviously did not read the references. You have no excuse for not knowing this. I provided the references right in the video. So why then are you promulgating these falsehoods? But even if the coal seams were adjacent to uranium pockets, Baumgartner went into tremendous detail on the math and physics on pages 614 through 616 discussing how carbon-14 is formed in the ground by radioisotopes and the quantities and rates of carbon-14 produced. Now, while he was specifically discussing the carbon-14 in diamonds, the numbers also apply to the excess carbon-14 in the coal. The conclusion was obvious and summed up on page 616 which apparently neither Jeebus nor the Pseudoscience Foundation want to read, so no problem, I will read it for you. We therefore conclude that in situ production of C14 by thermal neutrons at presently observed levels is unable by several orders of magnitude to account for the carbon-14 levels we measure in our diamond samples. Now, I don't know who YouTuber GMH1206 is, but he certainly demonstrated that he not only understood the skeptical arguments, he understood the creationary response and the science behind the arguments, unlike the Pseudoscience Foundation and Jeebus. GMH1206 wrote in response to a comment by the Science Foundation, Radiation, uranium-238 to lead six via 8 alpha and 6 beta decays over 4.46 billion years. If a single uranium atom converted 14 surrounding C12 atoms to radioactive carbon-14, each of these products would only last 5,730 years. This was explained in the video. To account for the anomalous carbon-14 in the coal, 99% of the original sample must be uranium, totally implausible. All coal deposits contain anomalous carbon-14. Did you even watch the video at the 8 minute mark? How does a trace element, uranium, with a half-life of billions of years produce an anomalous ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 with a half-life of thousand years and this remainder on the sample? This is like saying my slowly dripping tap is the explanation for why my backyard is a swamp. Pwned! GMH, thank you for writing in. I salute you. It appears I've gotten on the nerves of the anti-creation community on YouTube, what with my dozens of hours of videos packed with scientific facts, thoroughly refuting the evolution myth, and affirming creation as the faith that fits the facts. In fact, I've had repeated requests for a DVD version of my video response to Aaron Ra's 8th Foundational Falsehood video. I hadn't made the video with DVDs in mind, but I aim to please. So this video will be included as a bonus track in Crevo Rants Volume 3 DVD, which may or may not look like this. I haven't decided on the cover yet. Evidently, the anti-creationist community was irritated enough that they organized their first ever symposium to respond to Ian Juby. I don't know where or when this closed-door meeting was held, as I wasn't invited, but it must have been about two weeks ago. I came to this conclusion as the past two weeks I've had a barrage of emails and videos sent to me from a ridiculous number of anti-creationists that all said the exact same thing. Apparently, this meeting of the minds must have agreed upon what their best arguments were against all of the profound scientific evidence that I have presented over the years. Apparently, the best response the anti-creation community could come up with is... <laughs> You're fat! <laughs> you... <laughs> You don't even have a university degree, and you're not a professor! <laughs> to which I can only humbly respond, Well done. Keep up the good work. I'm sure you're convincing countless numbers of the truth of the evolution myth with your scientifically compelling and intellectually stimulating arguments. And the best of luck to you at next year's symposium. Uh, enough of that for this week. I'm your host, Ian Juby. Please subscribe to my channel. Remember, this program is exclusive right here on YouTube. And remember the words of Christ who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. See you on the flip side. Attention all personnel.